Hi there. My name is Minerva Perez, and I'm the executive director of OLA of Eastern Long Island, and you are watching Conversations with OLA. Uh, we have with us today our guest, Dan Lloyd, and Dan Lloyd is going to speak to us about the work he's doing through Minority Millennials and also Accelerate. Uh, OLA's production here of Conversations with OLA, uh, and also thank you to LTV, our wonderful partners, is a way for us to bring forward some of the conversations and the wonderful and exciting uh, inspirational people that we get to meet along the way. And uh, today getting to speak with Dan is going to be a real treat. So Dan, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. It's an honor and pleasure, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had first uh, had the chance to meet you uh, during uh, a panel that I was on with you uh, for a nonprofit uh, focus, nonprofit hub focus. Yes. yes. And uh, at that point, I learned, um, first of all, it was wonderful to hear you speak uh, about the work that you're doing with millennials. And uh, and so I want you to please talk a bit more about that. And, and we'll just kind of like bounce off of each other here. So Minority Millennials is an organization that you did found. Mm -hmm. um, tell, tell, tell us more about that. Yeah, so we launched it in 2017. It actually became an official nonprofit in 2018. And at the time, in my life, my personal life, I was kind of like in a, in a, in a position where I was trying to recreate my professional career, what I was doing. I had just gotten into um, a transition. I left New Jersey, I was 16, I got married. I lived with my parents. I was like mm -hmm. in this weird state. And I come from a nonprofit family, as I mentioned on the, mm -hmm. the panel. Mm -hmm. And I was just trying to figure out, like, what what can I really inject from my experience into that I care about? I really wanted to do something that I was passionate about, but also intertwine my experience. And on Long Island, specifically, like, in the Wine Dance area, Central Suffolk, I realized that there was a lot of my colleagues, young people of color, um, that were not really engaged in the political process. Not only were they not engaged, they didn't really have any interest. They didn't care. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you see this project? And, and, and my time in Newark, New Jersey, I spent there 15 years. I learned a lot about how uh, local government and state government can fund a lot of projects when it comes to economic development, but also how communities or disadvantaged communities mm -hmm. are kind of the foundation for economic development projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then if you're not involved or engaged, you really don't see that trickle-down effect go into your community. Mm -hmm. So we launched it to really just help young people of color become civically engaged. Mm -hmm. And since then, it's kind of become a three-tiered ecosystem. So our full mission now is help young people of color access jobs, build wealth, and become civically engaged. So we inject ourselves into three parts of what we believe is the most vital uh, ecosystem of a community, which is civics, mm -hmm. workforce, and economic development. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And so that's been growing since 2017. Yes. Um, and you, what are some challenges along the way, and how have you addressed some of those challenges to, to, to kind of make that real for people and not have it be the same 10 people you're working with over and over again? Yeah, I think the... The simple challenge is like this concept of power. So when we talk about civic power, or civic identity, what we're really talking about is how do we shift political will? Mm -hmm. And on Long Island, when you're talking about political will and you're talking about the social issues, it could be from housing, it could be from immigration, it could be um, public safety, it could be healthcare. It, it, whatever the social issue is, mm -hmm. you need to have that voting block that's going to stand firm and ensure that there's some type of pressure on local officials when you talk about civic governance. Mm -hmm. And so for us as an organization, where we're focused on 16 to about 36, it's really not just telling young people, go vote. Mm -hmm. It's why to vote and an education process between the why and the action. Mm -hmm. So um, there's been a lot of, um, a I would say, passion, especially with the summer of 2020, mm -hmm. where you saw mm -hmm. the murder of George Floyd mm -hmm. and just a lot of things come from COVID-19. However, that emotion and passion sometimes dies out. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. as an organization, is how do you continue to keep that passion, that emotion going on a local election when mm -hmm. it's not just a presidential election and it could be like a far Absolutely. left or far right issue going on. So I would say that's by far the single biggest problem is just keeping that passion in that vote because you really can't get anything done without shifting political will. No, no, not, not at all. Um, and, and then from the, for, so what area, what, what township is that mainly? Well, we're Long Island. We're all now. Long Island. Yeah, I mean, we're not oh. as far as in Wayne Scott. So okay, maybe soon. Maybe soon. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Um, but we I can still say, partner on things. Though. I would say no, absolutely. That, yeah. But we're I would say as far as a member base in a okay. community, you would say probably from the town of Brookhaven all the way out to Elmont. 
Okay. Uh, we are launching new chapters though soon. So we're going to be launching okay. a chapter in New York, New Jersey. We're going to be launching a chapter probably in Brooklyn or uh, Manhattan to represent the five boroughs. Okay. Hopefully up in Albany. And as well, please, yeah. I'm raising my hand. No, seriously. I mean, if if there were ways that we could support that, I would I would be thrilled to do that. Well, we have the structure, right? So we have the, the ecosystem. Yeah. So now that's why we feel confident to launch new chapters. Okay. The thing is, just making sure that the right people are leading it and not forgetting. It's very important. You can't just do civics without workforce. Yeah. You can't do workforce without economic development and sure. economic development without civics. So a lot of organizations will say, just focus on one thing. Mm -hmm. That's not how you really are mm -hmm. able to mm -hmm. be at the table mm -hmm. and not get left out. You have to maintain all three facets of that ecosystem. Yeah. I think also there's another organization out here that does some fantastic work, the Bridgehampton Child Care and Recreational Center. So they actually do a lot of workforce development. Is that Miss Bonnie? Yeah. Yeah, I know her very well. Yeah, She's yeah, yeah, Miss yeah. Bonnie's great. Um, um, so having them also on the east end of Long Island and kind of the work that Ola does, which is not all the same thing, it's an overlapping that we yeah. have here and there, but I think that the, the civic engagement piece of it and um, and also kind of on the other side of that, how to make sure that there is an environment or so that that ecosystem can kind of flourish yeah. uh, because you can have an ecosystem and plunk it down into the most inhospitable you know, place, yeah. and uh, and it's just not going to thrive. You know, yeah. so I think Ola is a great another entity there. I think, but maybe something, maybe some kind of triangular motion here. <laughs> yeah, collaboration. Yeah, I, mean, I, I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Exactly, and then, you know, Long Island's a very unique place, so you need collaboration between organizations that may be similar but are focused on different issues. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And the civic engagement, I mean, we have, like, as I've mentioned before, 50% uh, Latino student body across 24 districts. Mm -hmm. um, we also um, have been involved in certain aspects of uh, civic engagement that um, sometimes start to ring hollow when... Um, when people are coming forward and they are interested, but there really isn't a place for them. And that's because we don't have, you know, minority millennials, I think, because what we might do is work on a part of it and, and engage and get someone excited. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a whole process. You've got to stay in that whole process together, the whole cycle of, you know, wh why it's important, what this means, what, and sometimes even the education of what these positions actually are. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll hear over and over again, we need to have more Latinos in, in local government, more trustees or, uh, or, or in, in any regard or anyone in, in local government um, or even some of the paid positions that might be um, pay, on paid boards, let's say. What is it even meaning? What? Why is it vital? You know, you have to connect the vitality or the vital quality of yeah. what you're doing, and not just for name or status or oh, it's my duty to give back. It's like no, it, there's there's a, a life or death quality yeah. to these things, and if you can connect up with whatever that is for you, whether it's the environment, whether it's another social issue that's very important to you, um, access to public transportation, um, access to you know special needs services, and what's yeah. going on there. Yeah language access, these types of things, whatever is really kind of like driving you, what, how can that connect up to your civic engagement? Yeah, and I think, again, I, I like to reiterate this a lot anytime I talk about what we do with civic engagement because it's really, really crucial is the concept of power uh -huh. um, and the values behind that because a lot of times when you talk about power, people think it's a negative thing or it's mm -hmm. an evil thing, which mm -hmm. it can obviously become. Mm -hmm. But if you ask anybody, you know, would you... Do you like to feel like you have the power to support or help your mother or father? Mm -hmm. Or how do you feel if somebody is uh, bullying you in high school? You mm -hmm. feel powerless. So like no one likes to feel mm -hmm. powerless, but mm -hmm. you want to make sure that the values behind that um, power is beneficial to your community, to your family, or to your personal life, your professional career. Mm -hmm. So regardless, and even if it's representation of ethnicity or race, if that person in that representation does not have the values, the good values that exactly. reflect the community, it could be detrimental and potentially evil mm -hmm. to the community. So it's, it's very important to decipher between the two. Oh, yeah. And we, see, and we definitely see that. Yeah. So we'll often see that, you know, someone will say, oh, look at this person speak Spanish. Yeah. Well, honestly, <laughs> you know, sometimes that just is like you're just shifting the ball from one power hungry person to the other. And there's a level of exploitation. Yeah. There's a level of demagoguery. It's like, oh, well, now I control this group of people exactly. because I, exactly. so absolutely the value system behind that um, is key in all of it. And I think that we've got some sometimes some pretty bad modeling that goes on yeah. and, and not just in a local level, but sometimes on a, a broader level where people are really putting their attention 
uh, on, on news as they should, but then on a local level, it just kind of like disappears. It's like, it, it's invisible. Yeah. But when you scratch the surface, you start seeing, you know what? I actually really like what that supervisor is doing for exactly. that town. I, I, I watch some of those, you know, cable TV shows, uh, watching them speak at their town board meetings, and I really, I'm connecting with that person. But it's, it's uncovering that, connecting people to that structure and what it means for them. Mm -hmm. Is 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 laborious, and, and you need to have a dedicated effort to do that. Yeah. So, I'm glad and, you're doing. And that. and you know sometimes it's it's you know how do you connect that power to solve problems to a pain? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there's a pain in the community. There's yeah. a, is there, is an issue, or it could just be we want to elevate. You know, our community. We want to elevate our quality of life. Mm -hmm. that, um, we want to get to the next step. We want to be able to make sure that our children and grandchildren are able to pursue what we thought was an American dream, which we are seeing, though, is not necessarily what our parents had in the past. Mm -hmm. And so things are rapidly changing in the next five to ten years. And yeah. so we we need to, millennials, but also Gen Z and everyone, mm -hmm. has to have a sense of urgency as to, you know, who is in leadership and which direction are we going to because it's just shifting our entire way of life very, very fast. Yeah. And so we're going to need sound-minded people that do have values and understand the concept of power to protect us as a society. It's just the way it is. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, the the sense of um, and kind of cutting through a sense of apathy that older folks and I'm, I'm probably one of them. I don't think I do this that often, but I, I do see that people will look and say, "Well, you know, they don't care about this. They don't care about that." Not to say that any generation has it so much worse than another generation. But the level of overwhelm, yeah. how easy it is to be shut down when you're when you are just seeing one kind of challenging bad thing after the next, yeah. you know, that, that at a local level, being able to energize and really have a conversation where you can get your hands around doing something that is making a difference, that yeah. does uh, have a, a you know play a, an immediate role in the health of a community, the health of your family, the health mm -hmm. of yourself. Yeah. Um, that that that's the way that you you know you can help grow a, a broader understanding so that maybe that same person does end up being the person to help broker peace in all the millions of places that need to be uh, we need to have more peace but but especially right here in our in our own communities yeah and I think with technology obviously has given us the opportunity to communicate and see or even interact with billions of people social media Instagram TikTok but at the same time it's also mentally overwhelmed us. We have evidence of that now where yeah. humans, we still have a mind that's basically of, um, you know, 300 BC. Like we we haven't, our brains have not evolved, but we have, the technology has evolved as well. We're just constantly getting inundated <laughs> with information. Yeah. So many of us can't focus. They say that probably the most valuable skill set in the 21st century economy is just the ability to focus for 10 seconds. Wow. So most youth can't focus for three seconds. And then we're telling them, you know, like, what kind of job do you want to have? What kind of career do you want to have? Oh, you got to vote, by the way. Oh, my, you know, then they're getting bullied, not only in social media, but also in real life. So it's, it's that's why there's so much depression and mental health. And um, as humans, though, we all look for acceptance, affirmation and attention. So social media gives us the attention. It may not give us the acceptance and it may not give us affirmation. So then it's like we're still dealing with all these weird quirks that mm -hmm. um, is we're seeing is having a huge impact on us as a society and so we are actually kind of going back to where we just want to have a small community mm -hmm. you know be able to really interact on a personal level mm -hmm. as more artificial intelligence comes into play we're actually going to be looking for more authenticity between human beings so ironically we're going back into mm -hmm. a society that um i believe and as an organization again being able to civically identify with each other will be extremely, extremely powerful and beneficial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that's a that's a hopeful yeah. um, view as well, and and I think just a very honest one. We just last night had we do these uh, youth leadership dinners where we'll gather youth together, sometimes from a few different districts, um, and really talk about. They're usually 11th or 12th graders talk about uh, some of the challenges, some of the opportunities that they're seeing for themselves. And oftentimes they're a mix of mostly Latino, but not always. Uh, we also partner with Shinnecock Nation uh, and uh, and other organizations, Bridgehampton, of course, with Plani. Um, and last night, you know, the conversation, a lot of focus is on... Um, it's on the future, on, on even having a future, mm. you know. So when we're talking with students about what they might want to be doing next, and, and some of them have already applied to colleges, some of them haven't, but 
oftentimes what we're hearing in, in the room and through our text line, we operate a helpline from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, for mental and emotional health, is just a sense of, uh, of doom, of I don't have a future. Like not, nothing in my present world is sharing with me that, that I could have a future, yeah. you know? And, and that's the saddest thing because I think sometimes even adults when, uh, that, are, that are working with youth, it, they might be going through what they're going through but what's not presented enough over and over again is the fact that there's a purpose that you have, that you will find it if you don't know what it is right now, mm -hmm. that, that there is a future that you have and your being here and your con con contribution to that and whatever it is, yeah. even if it's you getting to be a happy person yeah. is a contribution. But there's so many disconnects between our youth and even feeling that they have a future. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean... And tell me some more about yeah, how I, you've I, seen it. I, I think that's also, you know, I, I'm, I really, really love history. But mm -hmm. um, you know the song Teenage Wasteland? Mm -hmm. It's like big in the 90s. And so, like, that, it's always been. It's know, always been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. feel like there's no future. Yeah, yeah. Break over yeah. your girlfriend. Oh, my life is over. <laughs> You're like 35 years old. I know you don't even talk to me anymore. But um, the irony, though, now is that we are actually shifting in a society into, like, a technocratic uh, community with te intelligence mm -hmm. and, and, and advancement. So they might be feeling that. They could mm -hmm. feel like, you know, a report just came out that 60% of jobs will be displaced with artificial intelligence in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So all that information, and then we're telling them to go to college, and now we're realizing that a four-year school may not even pay dividends. There's another report that just said that investment in the STEM is not even paying dividends. So it's mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff that they're getting um, inundated with where it can kind of feel like they don't have a purpose. But I would say... Uh, that is really cool and it is, is super positive is to your point on purpose mm -hmm. and happiness. And um, they have the ability to, I would say, as the first generation in this new kind of like technological society is to really um, define what that means in a way mm -hmm. that we haven't really been able to mm -hmm. figure out. Yeah. Because nothing is new under the sun. Mm -hmm. Humans have been dealing with all this <laughs> happiness, depression, whatever it is yeah. since the yeah. inception of mankind. Um, so it's a challenge, and this could be a challenge for them to solve that mm -hmm. we have not been able to solve yet, mm -hmm. and also make sure that we're steered in the right direction as a society because they're going to be leading us. The next 20 years, this is all going to change. Just mm -hmm. everything. As you mentioned, um, the organizations you work with, uh, like Shinnecock and everything, and there's a huge environmental shift right now to offshore wind. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that generation, Gen Z generation, those in high school can make sure that our communities benefit from clean mm -hmm. energy, mm -hmm. you know, and really make sure that the Shinnecock Nation and the groups that have not really benefited from fossil fuels and these type of billion dollar, trillion dollar industries mm -hmm. actually get the economic advantages mm -hmm. that is coming down in the next 20, 30 years. So it's a great opportunity to leave a mark, mm -hmm. more so leave a purpose mm -hmm. in this, in almost, it's almost a new society that's going to be happening. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be what, 25, 30 in this new society, mm -hmm. prime. Yeah. to leave a mark and to leave a legacy. So yeah. it's an incredible opportunity. And the thing is that, like, you, like you're saying, which I love hearing, is that this is going to happen anyway. This is just going to happen. So yeah. um, it's, you know, but there are ways organizations like yours and the work that you're doing um, uh, help kind of shape or guide or make sure the access points are there. Um, I'd say that out here sometimes it does feel like the structure um, is difficult even for an adult to kind of, or a, an older adult to even kind of get involved in. I, I feel like, you know, folks that are even watching this today or tonight or wherever they're watching, um, it, the idea that that you truly are making space for people, to, other people to be at the table. I mean, some things that, that it's even difficult for Ola to do, but even with our mental health work, we always have a middle schooler and a high schooler that we're paying to be part of every semester. So mm. that way, their, with their voice, with their, their opinions about whatever our outreach campaign is looking like or anything they want to bring, or if we're bringing people together to, that we're making the time to do that. And yeah. if I'm having a, a powerful or a, whatever, a big conversation with our assemblyman, you know, for our district, that I'm, I brought a middle schooler to that conversation, yeah. um, but in whatever way that we can, and, and not just for show, yeah. you know, yeah. let them, they have a bunch of things they've got prepared to yeah. talk about yeah. Yeah. and that they're going to kind of demand from you yeah. and you'd be able to listen to a demand yeah. of a middle schooler, you know, yeah. but I, you know, however we can encourage because I'll see over and over again, these initiatives that are supposed to be for youth that don't ever have youth at the table. <laughs> yeah. And it's kooky. <laughs> it's, very, it's, it's very wise of you. So we have a Gen Z coordinator, and she's a okay. senior in high school. She actually okay. just got stepped into Columbia. 
And I felt the same way. Like, you know, I'm 37 now. And when I started this, I was 30. So I was still kind of like in that young, cool phase. And then I realized, oh, I don't know anything anymore as far as like what they're doing. So I'm <laughs> yeah. advocating. Yeah. But actually, I'm advocating for a different age group now. And so when we brought in, mm-hmm. her name is Makala, to actually speak and talk for mm-hmm. high schoolers and the next generation that's coming up because their lived experience is way different than mine Absolutely. right now. Mm-hmm. I'm not in high school with social media. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm married. I have two kids. So it's like, I'm just not in that experience. So yeah. it becomes inauthentic to then advocate and talk about these things without them at the table. And ironically, again, to go back to history, if you look at like the 1800s, 1700s, and the way that our government was structured, it was founded by 20 year olds. It was like, <laughs> yeah. these were all like 20. Rabble rousers. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, and most societies and, and governments yeah. like everyone was very young i don't know where we ended up going with like you know like 80 year old presidents and stuff but um the, it's always been structured and and pursued by young people that mm-hmm. can lead it so but power is a a powerful drug and once yes. you have it you don't let go of it yeah and the longer that we live the longer that we're gonna try to hang on to this power but you know it, it really is with having the knowledge that there's we're not going to get anywhere with all this thing that we think that we're doing when we're hanging on to it if we're not creating the space so i feel that my my role and in, in this role is is making space yeah. i'm i'm just cu- kind of holding the door i'm yeah. making space and, and then just like getting out of the way yeah you know i mean i feel like that's a lot of what my role is and and our team is kind of getting younger and younger as well Good. um but it's it's really also just making sure that there's a level of accountability also because mm-hmm. we'll see different initiatives kind of come through, sweep through, and they might have a youth focus. But now I, I'm i kind of opening my mouth a little bit more about, well, yeah, but where, where's, where, where's the youth? Who, who's under mm. who's under 20 at this yeah. table? Yeah. Who's yeah. at least, you know, somewhere around that age? Um, and to really call it out a bit more yeah. Uh, yeah. because it's kind of too easy to do. Yeah. And people are like, yeah, but we're doing this for the, we're doing this for this generation and we're doing it for them. We're doing it for them, but they're not there. Yeah. It just, yeah. it doesn't work the same way. Yeah. Um, but I think there's, there's, you know, a, a long way to go, but at the same time, um, we're, mo- we're moving in, in that direction. Like you said, it's going to happen anyway, yeah. but why not put some, some English on it, some spin on it that we're, we're continuing to have uh, our values at the center of it, a good, a good heart about it. Why are we doing this? And I can't, I would, I mean, I also would say it's very important when you find a young person mm-hmm. that is passionate to like hold on to them for dear life because yeah. it is <laughs> extremely difficult to get five young people to really, really hone in mm-hmm. and be focused and, and collaborate and and have a passion for a mission. So if you find one or two, and this is for anybody that's working with young people, give them as much power as possible, you know, and empower them, support them, and really just make sure that they have the resources necessary. Because there is, there is though, I would say on the, on the flip side, mm-hmm. on the negative, there does seem to be just a disinterest in civics um, on the majority level of young people so mm-hmm. you know that is a, it is difficult to get it's them difficult to it's yeah. a little bit of a trust thing it's yeah. like you kind of have to prove it yeah prove it and if you keep disproving it disproving it it's hard to get someone to kind of come along with you for the ride yeah um, and also i think the other thing about when you get that person hang on to them and look at your re-examine your structure have them examine your structure yeah. how often do you meet when you meet how yeah. do you meet yeah. how do you value their input mm-hmm. because it might be old school and it yeah. might be not the way that they're going to work yeah. and then really have a you know Trust them to share with you what's another structure that might work that you're going to get the same or better yeah. from their involvement, but you're not steeping them in this old school system that exactly. just doesn't doesn't give them what yeah. they need. Yeah. yeah. But um, got a couple minutes left. I know that you're with Accelerate as well as a program director. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, Accelerate was started in 2011 mm-hmm. um, by, at the time, it was the town of Brookhaven and supervisor Mark Lesko. And um, a couple of advisors from the area, Dave Colon, Stacey Sykes. And the focus of, at that time was to just kind of create a collaboration between the research institutions that we have here, incredible ones, like Stony Brook University, mm-hmm. Brookhaven National Laboratory, Cold Spring Harbor, and Hofstra, who all are still currently on our board presidents, um, as well as Northwell Health, and the business community to create a thriving startup community with the intent of commercialization. And so we have these incredible research institutions um, that are solving literally global problems. Can we also make sure that there's a local startup community that's thriving, similar to like a Silicon Valley, but right here on Long Island. Since since 2011, we have invested into 30 startups. We have invested over $2 million, and we still manage a fund 
of about 21 startups. So I manage that as a program director. Um, and just making sure that they are able to get follow-up funding, get into Series A, Series B funding. And again, that is a focus on life science and biotech. So what that means okay. is that whatever they're focusing on has some type of genetic or biochemical or life science focus when it comes into the research that they're doing. Okay. We also just got a $1.25 million grant from the state. It's called a Hotspot Innovation. That's open to any type of startup. So that could be a software, that can be artificial intelligence, that could be anything. It doesn't have to just be life science and biotech. And the cool thing about that is if you have an idea, um, we can help you help get that idea to an actual the incubator. An incubator. We mm -hmm. have five incubators across Long Island that we're working with. And we'll also match any expenses up to one third. So if you're looking for an IP legal marketing, let's just say it's ten thousand dollars, we can cover up to three thousand three hundred and thirty three dollars on that. So any startup knows that can be a substantial cost sure. and we can help offset that. We're also doing a lot of events. We have an event coming up February thirteenth. That is a Tuesday at six PM at Broad Hollow Bioscience Park at okay. Farmingdale College. It's actually going to be in a wet lab. So, you know, just kind of changing wow. it up a bit. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we want to really make, there's a lot of cool entrepreneurs. There's, there's a huge research scene, but it's not, you know, we're just trying to get it. At Long Island, as you know, is the little, the, the layout is a little disconnected. So how can we bring the whole community together? And also just make a safe space for these entrepreneurs to connect and communicate and share ideas mm -hmm. about what they're working on. There's a really cool one. There's one out here, actually. His name is William Haynes. He has a company called Somnial. And so if you know anybody that has had sleep apnea, my father has sleep apnea, you have to wear this horrible mask. Yes, yeah. yeah. Really so he, he's working on that. Uh, he's And what's his name again? William Haynes. William Haynes. And yeah. what's any name? Somnial. 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 Yeah. So yeah. We'll, we'll make sure people get out there and look yeah. that up as well. Um, We've only got like a, a little short moment left. So I just want to take that moment to just thank you again for mm -hmm. coming on out here, for doing the work that you do, um, for the openness to maybe be able to collaborate in the, in the near future um, and, uh, and speaking with us today. Thank Absolutely. you so much, Dan. No, thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Okay. Yeah.